everyone happy evening a very good evening i hope and i believe all of you are doing well uh, a quick nod whether the audio visual is all good Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so first of all, the FMG results have been announced yesterday, and I've been receiving a lot of messages from the students that actually bring a smile on my face. Uh, you know those uh, gratitude messages, and that reinforces the faith in the work that we are doing. So thank you so much, and congratulations to all those who have cracked the FMG exam. And for those who couldn't, unfortunately, don't lose hopes because there's always another chance, and we are definitely going to do it next time. right and yes here we are into this image athon series the youtube live sessions that you have you have the entire playlist where you can see the schedule of the various subjects where we will be discussing the image based questions uh, in the various subjects by the respective educators yeah it's actually been long we're meeting after a long time and now we need to like you know uh, be into our last years of preparation you and me both together for the upcoming neat pg exam which is on 5th of march uh, pdf i'll share uh, after the session is over i'm sorry i forgot to share it before we could start the session right uh before starting the discussion a quick update uh, about what's happening on the platform so most important uh you have the upcoming all india mock test ai mt uh, tomorrow that is sunday at 9 am it's a free test for all of you and you win a chance to get up to 100% scholarship and also the top 50 rankers uh, get a mentorship session with a top educator right and the 25 lucky uh, test takers will also get the free notes worth rupees 7.5k so remember that this is a free test and you should actually be giving the grand test but uh, on multiple platforms like i always say uh, to practice multiple types of questions so this is tomorrow at 9 am and while enrolling you can use the code dr nikita uh, apart from that on the neat pg live platform the plus course we have the last month final booster batch which has started on 1st february it's a one month batch you can get access to it at just 4k and you have various modules in that where you have a uh, previous year questions that would be discussed in the entire month uh something wrong with the video it's only at my end no it's fine module 2 will have the most expected questions for neat pg uh, which will be covered by the top educators and module 3 will have the btr series by dr zarab so all of these will be covered uh, in the final booster batch which is the last month so for students who have started late or for students who feel like they have lost the direction and they are not understanding what to do you can uh, you know uh, follow this batch and you can do the last minute revision for the various subjects um uh, is it buffering only at my end guys or all of you are facing that uh, buffer thing all okay okay all right okay and i'm sure that um, uh, many of you in these last days as the exam approaches i received so many messages students saying that you know we are getting a lot of panic attacks we are getting anxiety we are getting stress and we feel like we are tired and we feel like giving up all i want to say it please don't stop until you are proud and keep fighting keep playing the match till the last ball the last ball can help you win the match so please uh, uh please please stay on the ground and please keep playing the match i want each one of you to win the match that you are playing right so let's start with the discussion of this question and uh, uh this one uh, we are seeing an inclination of the examiners towards this particular area in radiology and tell me what do you think would be the answer to this one what is the most likely underlying cause of this condition that you are seeing in this image what do you think would be the answer to this one uh 
Okay, so I see mixed bag answers here and that's why given particularly those confusing options. Whoever has answered E, that's the correct answer here. Whoever has answered E, that's the correct answer. That is repeated or chronic infection. Why? Because this is, what investigation do you think is this one here? Is it an IVP? What do you think? Is this image an IVP? No, this is a plain radiograph. Okay, this one here is a plain radiograph. There's no contrast in the other kidney. Uh, there's no contrast in the bladder here. This is a plain radiograph, X-ray KUB, where you see that there is this calcification in the pelvic calycial system with that staghorn appearance. So the diagnosis here is a staghorn calculus on the right side, also called as two white stone or the triple phosphate stone. Okay, the composition is triple phosphate, true white staghorn. And we know that the predisposing factor for developing the staghorn calculus is proteus infection most common. We have Klebsiella also, Pseudomonas also, uh, organisms which are urease positive. Because urease positive will break down the urea, generate ammonia, which will increase the pH of the urine and they will lead to the stone formation. So this is white proteus is the most common infection, right? So staghorn calculus, triple phosphate, uh, urease positive. What is the shape of the crystal of the true white stone, the staghorn calculus? What is the shape of the crystal? White, remember true white, white color clothes we wear in the funeral and funeral means related to coffin lid. Okay, so it has this coffin lid appearance. So this is what you see here, the coffin lid appearance, the coffin lid appearance of the true white stone or the staghorn calculus. Okay, that's the coffin lid appearance. Okay, going on to the next one. Now tell me what do you think is the diagnosis here? What do you think is this image is, this investigation is, and what is the diagnosis? Very good, Garima. Yes, very good, Vijay Raghavan. This is uh, PUJ obstruction. Okay, this is PUJ obstruction in IVP image. Okay, this is now IVP. IVP is nothing but basically contrast X-ray KUB. Okay, it is contrast X-ray KUB. Where you see the contrast in the pelvic calycial system, the ureter and the bladder, but you don't see the contrast in this ureter because here there is pelvic ureteric junction obstruction, right? So this is PUJ where you see there is hydronephrosis without a hydrourator, okay? It is hydronephrosis without a hydrourator because the contrast is not going into the ureter, okay? That is what you would see in. Uh, PUJ obstruction. What surgery do we do for PUJ obstruction? In a child with PUJ obstruction, what surgery do we do? What is the name of the surgery? Not PCNL. It's for the stone. Right. It is Anderson Heinz surgery. Absolutely right, Hardik. It is Anderson. Heinz surgery. Anderson Heinz surgery is what is done for PUJ obstruction. Going on to the next one. Now tell me what investigation is this one here? Is it a X-ray KUB? Is it IVP? Is it RGU? Is it MCU? What is it? What is this one? Absolutely right. The investigation here is MCU. How do you know that? You know that because you can see the urethra which is opacified here. We see the urethra which is opacified here. Urethra is not seen in IVP. So the IVP is out. Okay. Here you see the bladder cystourethrogram. MCU, mixturing cystourethrogram. And what are we seeing? What is the abnormality here? What is the diagnosis here? This has been asked in the recent exam as well. We are seeing the contrast in the ureter and the kidney in the ureter on both the sides. So in the micturating cystourethrogram, when the patient is micturating, bladder contracting, the contrast is going in the opposite direction upwards. So that is VUR, vesico 
ureteric reflux okay it is going in the it, there is reflux of the contrast which is happening so this is v u r okay this is v u r that we are seeing here in this patient so remember that the investigation of choice for v u r is m c u because it will show you the reflux of contrast going up if you want to see the scars in the kidney in a patient of v u r then what investigation should we do how much of renal scarring is occurring because of the reflux for that what nuclear scan it is a dmsa scan okay that's a dmsa scan for cortical scarring that we need to do right going on to next one here again from the nephro part because you are seeing question on this very very frequently what is the most likely diagnosis here in this image is it medullary sponge kidney is it putty kidney is it von hippel lindau or is it xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis okay i see majority of you getting this one right this is medullary sponge kidney this is not putty kidney what is putty kidney putty kidney is the calcified kidney in tb it's generally unilateral while medullary sponge kidney is bilateral that is what we are seeing here so look at this image here we are seeing this clustered calcification in the region of the medullary pyramids bilaterally so that is why this is medullary sponge kidney vhl is associated with renal cyst or the rcc what subtype of rcc do we have what is the diagnosis that we have uh what type of rcc it is a clear cell rcc that we have okay the clear cell rcc xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis anybody knows any sign in xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis it's associated with the pelvic calculus tagon calculus with the dilated calices that is called as the beer paw appearance the pelvis is contracted and filled with stone while the calices are dilated we get the beer paw appearance in xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis this is medullary sponge kidney where you have clustered calcifications in the region of uh, in the region of medullary pyramids bilateral that gives the paint brush appearance on ivp okay remember that gives the paint brush appearance right is this a clear with everyone look at this image here what is this image showing what's the diagnosis in this image here there is this unilateral kidney which is calcified and it is shrunken as well unilateral shrunken calcified kidney that is the putty kidney okay that is the putty kidney that we are seeing here correct is this clear with everyone so this is the putty kidney and this is the medullary sponge kidney bilateral this is unilateral okay going on to the next question now what do you think is this one a 30 year old male presents with acute abdominal pain and vomiting and based on the radiograph what is the diagnosis here absolutely right this is acute pancreatitis okay so this image is showing acute pancreatitis where what are we seeing in this image here absolutely right that's the colon cut off sign look at this colon containing air there is black air black air black air black air here and suddenly this air is cut off here okay after that you see the fluid there's no black air so the air is cut off here in the colon so this is the colon cut off sign okay what sign are we seeing here this is the colon cut off sign as in the recent exam and where do we see the colon cut off sign it is seen in acute pancreatitis uh, it is said that because of the pancreatic inflammation the inflammation spreads to the adjacent splenic flexure is the most common site where it goes and because of the inflammation it's like the bowel which uh, goes into paralytic ileus functional obstruction and we know that whenever the bowel goes into the uh, ileus it shows that air fluid level okay it shows the air fluid level right clear with everyone so this is the colon 
cutoff sign. Okay, this is a colon cutoff sign. Uh, next one. Uh, and before we go on to the next one, let's discuss about acute pancreatitis. Uh, what is the investigation of choice for acute pancreatitis? It is contrast enhanced CT because pancreas is a deep seated organ, might not be visualized on ultrasound. Though ultrasound is the first investigation that we do in any patient with acute abdominal pain. Right. And in CECT, what is the first finding that you see in acute pancreatitis as in NEET PG21 exam? It is bulky pancreas. Okay, remember the pancreas gets enlarged. Any inflammation, acute inflammation in an, any organ, be it kidney, acute pyelonephritis, acute pancreatitis, acute cholecystitis, the organ gets enlarged in size. So it is bulky pancreas is a very important clue for acute pancreatitis. And they give you the history of uh, elevated serum amylase and serum lipase. Amylase lipase are elevated. And whenever there is acute inflammation, what is the other finding that we have? We have fluid, right? There is fluid accumulation. So bulky pancreas with peripancreatic fluid, fat stranding that indicates acute pancreatitis versus chronic pancreatitis. What do you have in chronic pancreatitis? Any organ, chronic inflammation, there is fibrosis. Fibrosis means shrinking. So the pancreas gets shrunken. That means there is atrophic pancreas okay that means there is atrophic pancreas and remember c for c chronic pancreatitis the cc is there is pain of lakes appearance and there is calcification calcification and chain of lakes appearance is what we see with chronic pancreatitis the chain of lakes is the dilated pancreatic duct with the dilated side ducts as well right so whenever you have pancreatic calcification think of chronic pancreatitis pancreatic duct dilated think of chronic pancreatitis okay going on to the next one the bladder appearance shown in the image is seen in which of the following condition what appearance are we seeing here? Absolutely right. That is neurogenic bladder. Because what is the appearance that we are seeing here is the Christmas tree bladder. Okay, this is the Christmas tree bladder that we are seeing. How is the Christmas tree? The Christmas tree is like this. That is how the bladder is becoming. It's becoming elongated bladder. And why the Christmas tree? Because there are multiple diverticuli. All this which you see here, these are the diverticuli coming from the bladder wall. Any organ when the pressure is increased, it develops diverticuli. Right? To vent out that pressure, it needs some pathway so it develops diverticuli. So neurogenic bladder... The shape is lost because there is a problem with the tone. So from the round bladder, it becomes elongated. Because the pressure is high, it's not getting empty properly. So it develops this diverticuli. So elongated bladder with multiple diverticuli is Christmas tree. Versus if it is only elongated bladder with a smooth wall. What is that appearance called as and where do you see that? If it is just the elongated bladder. That is the pear shaped bladder or a teardrop bladder. It could be like this or it could be like this. It's when pelvic hematoma, something compressing on the bladder from outside. So from the round shape, it becomes this elongated bladder, right? So that is what we see here with the uh, pelvic hematoma or pelvic lipometosis. What is the appearance of the bladder with TB? TB causes uh, fibrosis contraction. TB is T that is thimble bladder. Okay, TB is T that means it shows thimble bladder, thimble bladder. Okay. Next one, this is a previously asked question in one of the NEET PG exams. So important one. A newborn presents with congestive heart failure and hydrocephalus. The history itself is enough to make a diagnosis. Transcranial ultrasound reveals a hypoechoic midline mass with the Doppler findings as shown. What is the diagnosis? 
it is vein of gallen malformation absolutely right the keywords here newborn with heart failure and hydrocephalus it is nothing but vein of gallen malformation now what is vein of gallen malformation aneurysmal malformation actually it's an av fistula okay there's an av fistula whenever in the body there is av fistula there is heart failure that can happen because of the uh, hyperdynamic circulation plus second because this is in the brain the csf hemodynamics are altered and that is why there is hydrocephalus so hydrocephalus with heart failure in a newborn the diagnosis itself is vein of gallen you can make a diagnosis even without the uh, image now what is the doppler showing so in the doppler basically this is the sagittal image of the brain that we are seeing that's the skull and in the midline you see this color pickup that is the flow the vascular malformation classically you would see like this the dilated vein of gallen malformation and you have it is draining into the straight sinus okay it drains into the straight sinus so that is what we are seeing here you will get the similar image in ct and mri as well sagittal image with a dilated vessel here draining into the straight sinus that is vein of gallen malformation okay that's a vein of gallen malformation right going on to the next one here what do you think is the diagnosis here again the history is very very important absolutely right very good this is osteoid osteoma a cortical tumor you can see there is cortex thickening along with the central nidus nidus is the hallmark of osteoid osteoma remember o o that means within the tumor one o is the tumor the other o is the nidus that is the trick to remember osteoid osteoma tumor with the nidus within this is osteoid osteoma and the classical history is pain which is worse at night because this nidus secretes prostaglandins which are maximum at night so therefore the pain is relieved by aspirin or by nsaids which block the prostaglandins correct and uh, what is the treatment for osteoid osteoma very very important question the treatment is radio frequency ablation okay the treatment is radio frequency ablation we put the electrode here and we ablate the nidus which is secreting the prostaglandins so the pain will go off okay so uh, look at this one this is the ct image where you see this cortical thickening and the nidus within it this is the electrode that we are putting into the nidus to ablate that nidus ct guided rfa radio frequency ablation is what we do for osteoid osteoma okay is what we do for osteoid osteoma uh next one here this is very very important bone tumor image what is this this is giant cell tumor going up to the articular surface remember for giant cell tumor that is gct the trick is gct occurs in a giant person that means in an adult 30 to 50 years of age giant involves the joint that means it goes to the articular surface it involves the epiphysis of the bone okay it involves the epiphysis and you are seeing this multiple trabeculae that is the soap bubble appearance okay that is the soap bubble appearance is what we are seeing the question is what is the treatment for gct the treatment is extended curettage okay curettage is the treatment for gct gct is a very very important and a frequently asked image in the exam very very important next one what do you think is the answer to this one very good this is tuberous sclerosis why is this tuberous sclerosis because what are we seeing in this image is those calcified nodules those calcified white is the calcification on ct right so we are seeing those calcified nodules along the ventricle lining that is the ependyma 
So this is subependymal calcified nodules are the feature of tuberous sclerosis. Okay, these are the features of tuberous sclerosis. One of these nodules, which is non-calcified, it can enlarge and it can turn into a tumor, which is SEGA, subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. Okay, what is the most common site for this SEGA? It is the foramen of Monroe. Okay, it's the foramen of Monroe. Remember, this is tuberous sclerosis, which is also called as epiloia, epilepsy, low IQ, and adenoma sebaceum. That's another important image in tuberous sclerosis. You have adenoma sebaceum, ash leaf macules, chagrin patch, Keenan tumors is what you see with tuberous sclerosis, cardiac rhabdomyoma, bilateral renal angiomyolipomas. In the lungs, there is LAM, lymphangioleomyomatosis. All these are the findings associated with tuberous sclerosis. Okay, very, very important. Uh, the phacomatosis, neurocutaneous syndromes are an important topic for your exam. Uh, so look at this one. What is this image showing, guys? What is this ultrasound image showing? So in this ultrasound, this is the kidney that we are seeing. Okay, if I tell you that this is the kidney. What is this lesion here? This is a hyperechoic lesion that we are seeing here. Hyperechoic renal lesion is the fat containing angiomyolipoma. Remember that when I say lipoma, that means fat containing. Fat is hyperechoic on ultrasound. It is dirty black on CT. It has a negative HU value. And it is both T1, T2 bright. It is both T1, T2 hyper intense. Remember that. This is the dirty black appearance of angiomyolipoma in the kidney. These are the dark lesions in the kidney. Compare it with the water density of the gallbladder. Water is gray color. This is more dark. That means this is less dense than water. That means this is fat containing angiomyolipomas. Remember hyperechoic and dirty black on CT and hyper intense on MRI is fat. Okay, that is fat. Next one, this is one of the recent asked questions. Uh, identify the investigation. Absolutely right. This is PET CT where you have the white bone. It's the CT scan, but it's not just black and white CT. Superimposed on that, you have those orange, orange areas. So this is PET CT. Question asked, it is a kind of fusion or hybrid imaging where two investigations, PET and CT, are combined together. What is the advantage? The advantage is out of that, PET is the functional imaging. All the nuclear medicine scans, they give you the functional information about the organ, whether it's hypofunctioning, it's hyperfunctioning. CT tells you about the anatomical changes in the organ, organ enlarged, organ shrunken, or there are... Uh, how many lesions so you basically combine functional imaging with anatomical imaging okay so this is pet ct okay this one is pet ct next one what do you think is the answer to this one This is not the coffee bean sign. Something which looks like a coffee bean sign. Actually, this is not the coffee bean sign. This is the Riggler's sign that we are seeing here. Okay, this is the regular sign that we are seeing here. Because what we are seeing here Look at this bowel wall. It is appearing so clear. Look at this bowel wall as well. Because actually there is black air outside. There is black air inside. So this is the, this is regular sign. Which is also called as the double bowel sign. Okay, it is also called as the double bowel sign. This is the regular sign. Do not confuse it with the regular striad. What is the regular striad? Regular striad is seen in gallstone ileus, where you have ectopic gallstone, small bowel obstruction, and pneumobilia. Okay, and you have pneumobilia. So this is regular sign, which is seen in pneumoperitoneum, where you are also seeing this 
triangular air in the Morrison's pouch. Anybody, what is this sign called as? Where you have the triangular air in the Morrison's pouch. That is called as the doge cap sign. Okay, that is called as the doge cap sign. This is the regular sign where the bowel is seen very clearly. Okay, so this is pneumoperitoneum. Okay, this is pneumoperitoneum that we have here in this image. Coffee bean sign is sigmoid volvulus. Football sign, cupola sign are also pneumoperitoneum, but they are different signs from the one which we are seeing here. Okay, and pneumoperitoneum is an image which is very, very important and is frequently asked in the exam. You have this air, free air below the diaphragm that you have in pneumoperitoneum. What is the best x-ray view for pneumoperitoneum? What is the best x-ray view for a pneumoperitoneum? The best x-ray view is the chest x-ray erect where you have the tangential beam going through the diaphragm. You can see the air under diaphragm. The best is the chest x-ray erect. If not erect, patient is not able to stand erect, then we go for lateral decubitus x-ray which is the left lateral decubitus. Okay, we do the left lateral decubitus with a horizontal beam for pneumoperitoneum. Left lateral decubitus with horizontal beam is what we do. If the question is, what is the most sensitive investigation for pneumoperitoneum? Most sensitive investigation is CT scan. Whenever there is air, CT scan is the most sensitive, not ultrasound. It is the CT scan, which is the most sensitive for air containing pathologies. Okay, for the air containing pathologies, right? And uh, what is the management here? Another question asked. Pneumoperitoneum most commonly is due to bowel perforation. So first we need to do is give IV fluids, stabilize the patient, and then we need to do exploratory laparotomy, basically to treat that perforation site. Okay, so IV fluids and then the exploratory laparotomy, right? Going on to the next one, which of the following is not true about the given condition? One of the important images in the exam, any hemorrhage in the brain, be it EDH, be it SDH, be it SAH or intraparenchymal hemorrhage, we get that image very frequently in the exam. Which of the following is not true about the given condition? Right. The correct answer here is left chronic EDH is seen. Now, first of all, look at the shape of this hemorrhage that you are seeing. It is biconvex shape, lentiform shape, which is seen with EDH. Remember, EDH has the idli shape. This does not cross the sutures. That is why it does not grow in the front or back. So, this is correct. Lucid interval. Remember, lucid is ED. Lucid interval is seen with EDH. It is due to rupture of middle meningeal artery. Correct, the artery which is in relation to the terior previously asked question. So, the incorrect statement here is C. Look at the hemorrhage here. Is it hypodense or is it hyperdense? It is white. White means hyperdense. Okay, this is hyperdense. Hyperdense is acute uh, hemorrhage or chronic hemorrhage. Acute hemorrhage is hyperdense. Hyperdense means increased density because of the fresh RBCs in the acute hemorrhage. It is hyperdense. Chronic hemorrhage, the RBCs get lysed, so the density decreases. Chronic hemorrhage would be hypodense, right? So, which is easily seen on CD scan? The hyperdense one, the acute hemorrhage. So that is why for acute hemorrhage, the investigation of choice is non-contrast CT. You would see the hyperdense hemorrhage. What is the investigation of choice for chronic hemorrhage? It is MRI. Because chronic hemorrhage, the hemosiderin from the iron in the hemoglobin, that can be picked up on MRI. And the sequence which is most sensitive is the susceptibility weighted imaging, SWI MRI is the most sensitive sequence for uh, identifying this hemorrhage, okay? So, this is uh, lentiform or biconvex shape, acute ADH. This is the right side. This is the left side of the patient, not your right or left. Here in radiology, it's the opposite. Your right is the patient's left. So, this is the 
left sided acute edh that we are seeing in this patient okay this is left acute edh right going on to the next one what is this image showing Correct. This is pneumothorax because what sign are we seeing here is the barcode sign or the stratosphere sign. Where you see the flat lines throughout the image, even in the deeper part of the image, we are seeing the stratosphere sign, right? This is pneumothorax which is uh, identified on E fast. Remember E fast is the extended fast. What is the full form of fast? Fast is not fast abdominal sonography. Fast is focused assessment with sonography in trauma. Okay. So it has been extended to evaluate the thoracic cavity where we look for pneumothorax, hemothorax. If there is pneumothorax, you would see the barcode or stratosphere sign. If it is normal, you would see the seashore sign. That means in the lower part of the image, you would see the granular appearance. Like this, look at this, there's a line and below that you see this granular, granular appearance at the seashore sign normal. Here, there is flat lines indicating the movement of the lung is not seen. So, this is the barcode or the stratosphere sign. What are the sites for FAST? So, in the FAST examination, you have this diffuse journal to look for this pericardial collection, cardiac tamponade, the right hypochondrium the left hypochondrium and the pelvic area to look for blood around the bladder, okay? So, in FAST, we do the B mode. In E FAST, even the M mode is included to look for this barcode sign. This is on the M mode of ultrasound. In the extended FAST, we have the thoracic cavity, right? When do you say it is FAST positive? What is the purpose of doing FAST? A patient with uh, abdominal injury, blunt abdominal injury, you want to look for blood bleeding from anywhere. So basically, we look for free fluid in a patient of trauma is considered to be blood. So the presence of free fluid anywhere in these areas is taken as to be blood. That means there is bleeding occurring from some organ. So if the patient is stable, the next step we do CECT to evaluate from where this bleeding is happening. If the patient is unstable, we time nahi hai to save patient's life. We need to take the patient for surgery. Okay, we need to take the patient for surgery. Right. So, remember that uh, this is the concept of FAST. Uh, next one. What do you think is uh, this radiograph showing? Very, very important. What is this radiograph showing? Absolutely right. There is pneumothorax here. Look at this left-sided thorax. Look at this left-sided thorax. Compare it with the right side. It's jet black. There are no vascular markings on the right side. On the right side, there are vascular markings. On the left side, there are no vascular markings. It is jet black. And this is the collapsed lung. The visceral pleural line along with the black air. So basically, this is pneumothorax. Okay, this is pneumothorax that we have. Okay, so remember that pneumothorax means air and air is black on x-ray on and CT. So you would see this jet black air without any vascular markings in pneumothorax. Okay, right. The trachea will be shifted to the opposite side because of the pressure created by pneumothorax. Okay, going on to next one. Tell me what do you think this patient would have presented with which clinical symptoms? Correct. So, what clinical symptoms this patient would have presented with? This is intersusception. Uh, the most common history that we have is the red current jelly stools. Okay, the most common history that we have is the red current jelly stools. Red is the blood and the current jelly is the mucus in the stools. Right, and the diagnosis here is intersusception. What are we seeing here in intersusception? We have this 
plus sign that we are seeing. So when you do barium enema in a patient of intersusception, barium goes up, barium goes up. At the site of intersusception, barium cannot go ahead. So it forms a claw around the intersusceptum. So the first sign that we have is the claw sign. If there is some space between the intersuscipients and the intersusceptum, the barium will go in between the two, just surrounding the intersusceptum. So like the lining, the claws, coiled spring is what we are seeing here. Both of these signs have been asked in the previous exams. So this is the claw sign and the coiled spring sign that is seen in barium enema in intersusception. What is the management, the first treatment here? What is the management, the first treatment here? It is pneumatic or hydrostatic reduction, right? So we insufflate the air through the rectum with the pressure of the air. The intersusceptum is forced out. So pneumatic reduction, air enema or hydrostatic reduction is what is the first treatment that we should be doing. Okay, right. Next one. I mean, what do you think is uh, this image showing? If I tell you that this is a patient presenting with metroragia. This is a female, a 35-year-old female presenting with metroragia. What is the diagnosis? Correct. This is a polyp because most important previously asked question, this is the feeding vessel sign that we are seeing here on doppler you are seeing this vessel which is supplying this lesion look at this image here this is the endometrium the hyperechoic one within that endometrium we are seeing this hyperechoic lesion that is the endometrial polyp okay that's the endometrial polyp when you switch on the doppler you see the vessel supplying it what is the investigation that can help you differentiate endometrial polyp from fibroid. What investigation can help you differentiate polyp versus fibroid? Right, it's a saline infusion sonography. Okay, saline infusion sonography is a very important investigation where you put the saline into the endometrium by cannulating the cervix and you would see that the endometrial polyp is within the distended endometrial cavity. Okay, the polyp is within the cavity. The fibroid would be outside the endometrial cavity, right? So when you put the fluid, the saline into the endometrial cavity, the polyp will be inside the cavity. The fibroid will be outside the cavity. So if this is the cavity, the polyp will be inside. The fibroid is the leomyoma, the myometrial pathology. So it will be outside the, the distended endometrial cavity. Okay. Is this clear with everyone? Right. And yes, that was about the most important images, the image -thon in radiology. The images that I wanted to discuss, make sure you revise all of these. Of course, this is not all inclusive. But this is like the must know and the most important images that everybody must know before the exam. I hope you have learned out of this and there are going to be many more sessions this month that we will have for the last minute revision for your upcoming exam. And uh, yes, we are trying to figure that out, PR and everyone. And uh, uh, KBMD, we might have one KBMD tomorrow. I'll update you on the Telegram group, Konbanega MD. Uh, we will have one session uh, tomorrow afternoon. I'll keep you posted on the Telegram group, Dr. Nikita's Rad Synapse. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in. And goodbye. Take care. Keep studying. Keep revising. And